Atmosphere is an important component to giving a game its character, or even just making it memorable or immersing the player into the world. Now, there are plenty of games with fantastic atmospheres such as Stalker, Half-Life 2, Amnesia Dark Descent, Nier Automata, yes I'm counting that one, Soma, Alien Isolation, the Silent Hill games, especially too. And yes, these may all be horror related with the exception of the silly robot one and the dystopian hellscape showing off my taste in games. But you get the idea of course. There are many elements to a game's atmosphere, but in the end it should all come together to create something unique. Now, there's always one game I feel kinda goes under everyone's radar, despite how popular it really is. We're talking about System Shock 2. The game takes place 42 years after the events of the first one. We're given background info on an AI named Shodan, who went a little crazy and developed a bit of a god complex, before she was promptly dealt with by the first game's protagonist. An advertisement then plays, featuring Trioptimum's newest technological endeavor, the Von Braun, the first ship capable of faster than light travel, accompanied by the UNN Rickenbacker. And then at the end, we get some weird message about some wannabe girl boss giving a yap session. It's not important, don't worry. Finally, we're dropped into the game and we can proceed with character creation. Now, System Shock 2 has a more diegetic way of forming your protagonist. Instead of a stat screen, we get the option to pick our branch of the military that we wish to serve under. Now, I go with the Marines since I wanted to do an all-rounded combat-focused build. You arrive at your base camp after a year of basic, and you can walk through these corridors to enter a shuttle which will transport you to where you need to be trained. This acts as your stat allocation. Also, don't go with repair, it's useless. After concluding our training, we sign up to join the Von Braun's expedition. Five months later, well, something is clearly wrong, and we're frozen in cryosleep for some reason, just to be awakened by a woman named Janice Polito, who mentions that we have cybernetic implants all of a sudden, and that she's up on deck four. By the way, I started the game with a grenade launcher, because I went into heavy weapons. I love this thing. I make my way up the ladder, input the funny number, and as I continue along the tutorial route, you can see explosions, damage, and bodies are just littering the halls of the Von Braun. But during one point, we do get a glimpse inside of another room of the ship through a window of a woman running, followed by some mutated man giving chase. Look, something really bad is going on on this station, if that monster in the camera wasn't already a dead giveaway. One thing I'd like to mention is an audio log pertaining to us, actually. A man named Grassi left Polito a message questioning her actions about augmenting us with cybernetic implants that were outlawed well after the events of Citadel Station. Keep this in mind, there's definitely nothing strange going on behind the scenes. No, no, not at all. Now, I bet you're thinking, Kobe, when does this scary happen? Oh, don't worry, it will, very soon. Instead, we get this track that plays the moment you enter the medical sector of the ship. Yes, this weird ass techno music plays in a game that I'm trying to sell to you as a horror experience. So let's quickly go over what I mean. System Shock 2 can go from feeling like an action FPS or a dungeon crawler, all the way to terror that varies from each room and floor of the ship. Through the game, you'll see bodies littered everywhere, and words written in blood on the walls, like some of them will be callbacks to Citadel Station, for example. Oftentimes, you'll have this droning ambience that makes you dread continuing further, like this one. Or this. Grotesque enemies like the cyborg midwives, even scenes like this. To reinforce the disturbing factors of this game, just look at the faces of the male NPCs. <laughs> that right there is pure terror, that guy saw something. How about the shifts in ambient music that plays when you enter certain rooms, like this one. I'll, um, I think I'll come back later. The voice of the ship's AI, Xerxes, whose voice has his autonomous demeanor, will echo off on the intercoms, specifically talking to you at times, seeing you as an intruder, nothing but a cancer in what will become the eventual body of the many. <laughs> oh, right, who are the many? Oh, don't worry, you'll know soon enough. But to give Xerxes some credit, it's wonderfully strange to hear him repeating standard programmed lines that wouldn't seem out of place if he wasn't already hacked into. For example, here you can listen to him remind everyone that there's a mandatory census check. To me, this can be perceived as just regular programming to ensure that each ship member is accounted for, or a veiled threat to anyone aboard the station that wants to give themselves up to the many or risk dying and rotting away. Very nice stuff. Xerxes is a nice addition to the game. Provides a good reason for this all-seeing eye that is working against the player while giving the AI a semblance of sentience. I like Xerxes. 
This face is also goofy as hell, but really creepy at the same time. Nearby, an image of a ghost will play, which is a side effect of your cybernetics, because Ken wanted ghosts in his game, just like in Bioshock. These serve as a way of showing the events before the disaster. Sometimes they show off someone's actions. Other times you get these peaceful moments before disaster struck. Other times you get really violent or depressing sights. Second medium for our lore is audio logs, and it's our primary source of information. Have you ever wondered where audio logs came from in all your favorite games? It's because of System Shock 2. I know they were also in the original, but to me too, it feels like it just greatly assisted in cementing them in video games. They offer background information about the plot at large, world building, plot points that have yet to be revealed, and even hints to give the player an idea on their objective, or maybe hint at something they should be on the lookout for. Inside the chemical storage, I find an audio log that sounds like the woman from earlier during the intro cutscene talking about how ridiculously easy it is to hack in the Xerxes system because someone did it to play Elvis Presley music. Which sounds goofy, but of course, as you can see, the invading force of this ship has already done that. Turning all the cameras, turrets, robots, and every other operating system against the people of the Von Braun. These cameras and turrets probably are giving you mad Bioshock vibes, since that game is a spiritual successor to System Shock. All in all, just think of Bioshock as another one of Ken's passion projects. Then he made Infinite. It was an okay game. The best part was Elizabeth. Oh, and uh, she was cool in the game, too. Clearly, Trioptimum hasn't learned their lesson, somehow. Hell, according to the audio logs, this mission shouldn't have even started due to the fact that the ship's reactor is having constant maintenance issues, leaving a good portion of the area of engineering flooded with radiation. We also find an audio log from Cortez of Engineering, who brings up how almost all of the ship's systems are failing, and how other members of his team keep disappearing, implying some insight that this was a very calculated attack. Side note, I was able to get some bullets and a hypo here by popping a speed hypo. Since I'm cool and I was actually able to get it and I felt very good about myself. Fun fact, you can die from running in the walls if you pop this thing and I love that. Along the ship's many levels, there are these bio-reconstructors, which act as your spawn points. If you die on a level, but you didn't activate one, it'll act as a game over. And if you didn't save, like I may or may not have done many times because I'm an idiot, you'll lose out on progress, so finding these should be a priority. Inside the morgue, we can find an audio log from Grassi, which gives us a good lead on what the catalyst was for the situation on the Von Braun. All we know so far is that something was found on Tau Ceti 5. We also get a name, that being a more dubious figure that we learn later, by the name of Kerenchkin. The Von Braun's captain and Trioptimum's representative, as well as Kerenchkin being Diego's number one op. I recharge a power cell and I make my way to the crew quarters section of medical. Xerxes warns the entire ship of our location and tries to question our purpose asking if we're working for her and how she tried to destroy our whole species. Gee, I wonder who we could be talking about. Oh, so they may be hard to notice, but there are monkeys aboard, and I assume that they were infected by our attackers, with the exception that they are really pissed off because they still remember all the experiments and vivisections performed on their kin, which they display their frustration by slinging fucking elemental magic at us. While we're at it, let's go over the humanoid beings we've been fighting so far. Surprise, surprise, they're the crew. Obviously, we can see their skin is covered in 90s texturing, which is later revealed to be tumors, enjoy that thought, and there is a worm connected to their head. What I love most about hybrids are their voice lines. They don't do these zombified moans, but they actually speak out at you. Not just random combat lines, no, but it's implied that the host of this parasite is still conscious because they will apologize for attacking you against their will. They'll even tell you to run away at times since that's all they can do to help, hoping that you're able to get away before the parasite uses their body to harm you. It's honestly really depressing once you come to this realization. Horror of being conscious while most likely going through the most excruciating pain, all while your body is acting on its own, has got to be one of the most terrifying concepts in fiction. I love this shit. I don't, I don't love what's happening to the, you know, poor people the Von Braun, but as an idea, it's pretty sick. If this does sound familiar, I think of it as like the Flood from Halo. I find the keycard for crew quarters and I begin looting room to room. Inside one, we find an audio log from Karenchkin, who is obviously acting in Trioptimum's best interests, as he sees the transmission from Tau Ceti as a pile of cash. However, I think this audio log is more intriguing. Here we find an audio log from Janice Polito, who sounds almost unrecognizable due to her demeanor being more calm and rather nice compared to how she's been treating us so far. I don't know what we did to her, but uh, we pissed her off, clearly. She goes on about an artifact that a man named Bayless brought back from Tau City 5. You beat the judge. Speaking English. 
gosh. Oh my god, it's so on the nose. I take the bulkhead back to the lobby of medical since I now have an access card to go deeper. In a side room, we can find an audio log from William Diego, and if his voice sounds familiar, it's Nick Valentine from Fallout 4. First time playing this game, it was kind of a whiplash to hear him speak, especially in Thief, I just wasn't expecting it. However, his audio log gives us some insight into the schism between him and Karenchkin. I cannot be circumvented. I cannot be tricked. I cannot be manipulated. And I cannot be bought. Just because my father swam with the sharks doesn't mean that I do. You get this sense of integrity from him since Diego wants to be better than his father. He wants to hold on to every bit of humanity that corporate and political drama can ruin in a man. In this operating room, I find an audio log that shows what happened to Watts and a patient who were the first of many to be infected by those on the Rickenbacker. Hold him down. I'm yes. trying to. The bloodbath tells us that this is where one of what is probably many initial assaults started. Grassi dies on the operating table, so I take the log which holds the code, and I show off what the grenade launcher is capable of. God, System Shock 2 has such an amazing grenade launcher. Down here I enter the quarters of Cortez, and this gives me a good chance to bring up something I really like about System Shock 2's world. The consistency. Listening to the log, it's clear one of the grunts dealt with Cortez, I like how you can clearly see his arm right here, not just a missing body or just a randomly placed log. Because this is the feeling that other logs we find from him shows that he was actually taking action against the many and trying to maintain the ship as it was breaking down before he was slaughtered in his room. I also love how it's implied that additional damage was done because of the amount of stress he was dealing with after seeing his friends and co-workers die. It's actually not something I love so much now that I think about it. What is wrong with me? One thing that kind of irked me about Bioshock's audio logs is that most of the time they were just placed there. For example, in the medical pavilion, you'll find an audio log of Andrew Ryan repeating his ideals. But why is it here? In System Shock 2, there's usually a good reason for someone wanting to leave behind an audio log. Now, the halls are riddled with radiation, so in order to reach the engine cores, we must expunge all of it so the door can become unsealed. As you go forward, you'll get this cutscene. Trust the feelings of the flesh. Voices fading in and out. A cacophony of sound speaks out at you in a room full of flesh, pulsing tubes, tendons, and nerves. This is the first reveal of the many, a parasitic hive mind that was brought from Tau Ceti 5. They drop cryptic messages about their mother, going on about why you should join their symphony of life, or else you'll be left to rot and not embrace the joy of their collective. If you choose to lie down with the machine, we will rend you apart and put you separate from the joy of the mass. Yeah, that's fucking horrifying. Anyway, moving on. <coughs> Following the cutscene begins the first difficult part of the game, at least for me. Other than the game trying to trick you into falling down into this pit, which is kind of a dick move, you'll find this section with plenty of turrets and a cargo bay. You can see why I got scared here. Oh, Jesus! I don't know what it is with this area, but I always have a hard time going through it. At this stage of the game, ammo and med hypos are still pretty scarce, and enemies are numerous. Hello. Max, androids, turrets, and the many, many monkeys roam about. Each area is tightly packed, too, making it easier for enemies to close the gap, and it is extremely easy to fall if you're not careful, or if you're stupid like I am. Ah yes, robotic enemy explodes in a video game. My fault. Speaking of falling, there's this obvious troll, which involves this broken elevator. So if you're the inquisitive type, you'll go up to the top and see what's up. Here you can see the devs even entice you with nanites at the very end of the elevator. But walking onto the platform causes it to fall, which will kill you instantly, and since I don't know how to save often yet for some odd reason, it reset all my progress back from before the cutscene started. I hate myself sometimes. You can find an audio log from Bronson, the chief of security, who is an important figure that we will get to later. She's adamant on understanding what happened and containing the situation, since she has a strong sense of duty. Join. We get a hint on how to hack the turrets from her audio log, but I never tried it since I don't like getting close to those things. I find the code to the fluid control room, but I am directed to the storage room to secure a hardware override, which will allow us to soak up all the radiation and after we plug it in and lift the lockdown. I'm gonna throw you out of Keep an eye out. They're mobilizing their real forces and they know exactly where you are. 
Finally, after that whole ordeal, we power up the port nacelles and restore power throughout the ship, opening access to the main elevator. Take a shortcut back to the main elevator, and it's here where I find one of the creepiest enemies in the game. This right here is called the Cyborg Midwife. The art style for her model is nightmare inducing, but don't worry, her lore is just as disturbing as her face is. I'll cover that very soon. Before I leave for deck 4, I'll go over the research mechanic so you know what I'm doing in certain clips. You'll find items that you can't use or identify, unless you research them. Researching will give you the ability to use special weapons or implants, but it's also nice to research the organs that you find off of enemies, since they only require one point in research, and not only do they give you lore on the enemy, but also a permanent 25% damage increase on that enemy type. It also details their weaknesses too. That cyborg midwife giving you some lip? Research them and you'll learn about their interiors and how they're mostly metal despite their fleshy upper torso, making armor-piercing rounds excel at putting them down. There's also this analyte organ which passively heals you over time, making it a must since it again requires only a single point in research. It's also what these chemical storages are for, since you'll need specific chemicals to finalize research of anything aside from a couple of organs throughout the game. Deck 4 is locked off because of some growth blocking the shaft. Hydroponics is where the game finally grew on me, and it's when the atmosphere finally sucked me in. Nearby we'll find an audio log from a man named Miller. Listening in, we'll learn that it's very clear Anatoly Krenchkin, because I'm not calling him Krenchkin anymore because I'm lazy, was the first to be infected, and that he single-handedly placed plants throughout the entire ship to fester after infecting the entirety of the Rickenbacker. It's also another log in like the next room that confirms this. Ed is full of wonderful ideas. I swear to god, the voice shifts are what really sells the horror factor with the many. Not only that, but you'll also often hear the many speak to you. I don't know if this means that you're infected, but your augments are keeping you alive, or if the many are just able to psionically communicate with you. But the overlapping voices that fade into one and that echoes off are very unsettling. Now these toxins, or four of them, each is required to obtain. Be sure to grab them all. I'm gonna show off the fantastic level design in System Shock 2. This door is locked, so I instead just break the glass to bypass instead of going the long way around. We see eggs down below, but I go into the next room and find a well-maintained grenade launcher to replace the shoddy one that we spawn with. This next part is some fantastic bit of writing regarding the cyborg midwives. Here we see a vision of Miller and a woman strapped to an auto dock. Nearby inside the chemical storage, you're attacked by a midwife. Upon looting her body, you'll pick up an audio log from a woman named Bloom, who discovered plans for the cyborg midwife, but with the exception that their DNA sequence was of her own. Meaning yes, the woman strapped down had to have been Bloom, and that this specific cyborg was the original. This explains why all their models look the same, rather than just arguing that they only stuck with one model to save up on dev time. Another audio log informs us that the numerous amounts were because of Miller requesting female staff to come down into hydroponics and assist him before they were placed under the knife. The purpose is so they can watch over these eggs which house these little slug-like worms, which most likely would be used for infection. I love this. On my first playthrough I didn't care enough to retain any information on the lore or the background, but when I took that chance and all the pieces fell together, I was amazed. This right here is good writing and well-crafted horror, nightmare fuel incarnate, and all of this just from a single enemy. System Shock 2's world has a reason for the existence of each analid, and really each enemy in general. Spiders are there to absorb energy for storage. These big brutes we've yet to see are meant to act as a security force. The slugs for infecting other species, and the list goes on. Speaking of eggs, this level introduces them. You can get close to loot the healing gland off of them, but if they hatch, they'll release a slug. And if you get too close when they hatch, you'll get your toxicity level increased, which drains your health and takes a long time to fully deplete without a syringe. I love how the mind of the many tries to dissuade you, since they know you're gonna destroy them. They're literal children. Babies must sleep. Babies must rest. They know biomass is plenty, but limited on the Von Braun. Again, the voice effects are unsettling. Your own kind sees you as a threat. Why do you murder the No matter. The line is drawn. You will cease to be. It is just a question of who will bring your end. Us or you. I do be hearing voices in my head though. I ventured down into the first hatchery, but I needed one more chemical to finish researching Toxin A. 
I actually checked my logs to see what each manifest held for a necessary chemical, and I backtracked to the elevator to secure that precious piece of antimony. Saved it. See that? Saved that pronunciation. While I was exploring, I found another audio log from Anatoly, which confirms that Diego is infected. Now I go through the entire hydroponic sector, and I place each toxin into their slots to stunt and reduce the growth. However, there are still two more that we must locate. Through hydroponics, you'll have to recover these key cards that will allow access to locked off sections. We'll find yet another audio log from Polito, who mentions how the AI she found is now part of the ship's computer system. Anyway, grenade launcher do boom. Also find an assault rifle that can carry you throughout the entire game, Bruh. but I can't use it right now since it requires a max standard weapon skill, but we will hold on to it. Why do you go so slowly? Do you think this is some kind of game? It is only through luck and my continued forbearance that you are even alive. Now move. You're a lot nicer in your audio logs. There are some supplies inside each side room. Loot them up, eliminate each enemy, and place a toxin to air this bitch out. On my way back, you'll fight a standard grunt, which holds an audio log from Turnbell, who recorded it just in case it was useful to anyone. This theme of fighting back continues on, and again, I will cover this more later, but just know that it's one part that I really like about System Shock 2's story and characters. In the final room, which is just so creepy and vastly different compared to the beginning level, we will find an audio log from Nick Valentine himself that is, well, creepy to say the least. They tell me I will float through the air and strike at the foes of our biomass with my mind. This next part is very special because it's here where I find what is probably one of the most horrifying audio logs I've ever had the displeasure of listening to in a video game in all 22 years that my mentally ill self has lived on this earth. God, don't do it! Please don't! Glory to the many. <laughs> I am a voice in their choir. Oh, Jesus. Dude, the scene I pictured in my head was visceral. Anyway, there's spiders now. I hate spiders, and yes, they will get bigger, and of course, more resilient as time goes on. I blame you for this, Ken. Life grows within the womb of these walls. Life that has never seen the surface of the earth. I place the last toxin inside and head on back. For that, I do want to mention that there's an EMP rifle and powered armor on a corpse in this section. I'm not doing an energy build, so I won't be taking it, and obviously you can see I'm not using the laser rapier, but I believe that this is the only area where you can obtain this armor, so it's a must if you want to spec into energy weapons. Operations holds another overarching side plot of the characters, but we will get to that. Instead, let's go meet Polito. Oh, fuck. What, was I tricked by the many- The Polito form is dead, insect. Are you afraid? What is it you fear? The end of your trivial existence. I am Shodan. Holy shit! Yeah, she's literally on the cover and the audio log spoiled it. Although I have to gush about just how great of an antagonist Shodan is. She's perfect in both games. She sees herself as a god, something above the beings of flesh. She taunts you, belittles you, and her performance and presentation is just fantastic. Shodan really makes you feel inferior to the bigger picture of things, even though you're the main character. Not a lot of antagonists are memorable, but Shodan definitely is. Now here we get our first exposition dump. She goes over the origins of the many and how she ended up here. There was a grove that was shot off in the space which still contained data loops of Shodan and the creatures before they evolved into the many and started acting quite rebellious to their mother. If you thought fake Polito was rude, Shodan just downright degrades you. I'd argue it's hot, but she tends to go a little overboard with her insults to the point where it just feels personal. She does comfort you sometimes though. You are an effective drone, human. Thanks, mommy. I have to activate these sim units that will give Shodan more power over the ship, because that's a great idea, and severely weakening Xerxes. However, we must find these chips which cyborg assassins, we couldn't get any more dorkier than that, carry. You performed well, insect. They are very deadly and fast. As you can see here, I get jumped by one and almost die within a few seconds. However, this also brings up something that I love about the game, and that's going back to its continuity. 
For example, why are the sim units down? Because a guy named Malik got infected and started to sabotage them. As for the cyborgs, their trioptimum assets that Malik reprogrammed as a contingency to safeguard the reversal cards in case someone wanted to reprogram Xerxes. As we continue, we can see how bad the infection got. In the crew quarters, we can see it's really bad. Inside one of the rooms, you'll find Malik's corpse with an audio log that shows that he was glad he could achieve his goal in the many's plan before being put to rest by Bronson and her men. Throughout the level, you'll find these recordings from Bronson, which explains her reason for being here. She got wind of what was happening to Xerxes and went up to investigate. You'll learn that the situation got so bad that Bronson ordered martial law, ordering certain sectors to be locked down. Inside of the mess hall, we get a vision of someone trying to talk to Bronson before he and a group of other people are executed by Bronson and her men. Bronson's plan of containing the infection was wiping out anyone who was infected, and in doing so, executing those who violated the lockdown, regardless if they were exposed to the parasites or not. Personally, I started questioning the fates which befell the random bodies strewn about. Did Bronson execute a majority of them, or did the many really infect this many people, slaughtering those who resisted? Now, I might be reading into it a bit too much, and I'm very undereducated when regarding literary analysis, but I think it's cool. I don't know, I, I like this. I like the, the thoughts. Aside from devastation, that isn't so cool. Common Bronson and many L. Inside the same general area, we can get an audio log from Bayless, who reveals that he had our memory wiped at Polito's orders, questioning her if we even volunteered for the implants or the memory wipe. He brings up how she feels like a completely different person. Yes, Bayless, your suspicions have been vindicated. This tells us that Shodan took over Polito's identity right before the outbreak reached the Von Braun, and that Shodan kept us on standby for whatever reason. At the end of the game, we can find an audio log of Polito apologizing to us for bringing Shodan aboard and having Shodan use us as her puppet. Eventually, you'll come across a room with a sim unit and many corpses. This is Bronson and her security team. She leaves a log on her demanding any other survivors to continue fighting right before she bleeds out. Well, Bronson, maybe there would be survivors if you didn't fucking shoot them all, but it's okay. She does mention how she doesn't regret anything she's done, believing that she did the right thing that her duty demanded of her. Even though it seemed like she had everything under control, the many were, well, just too much for her to handle. Fighting a hive mind can be quite difficult. Nearby, you'll find an audio log from Diego commanding Bronson to give up or else he'd send an entire army down here to kill her, leaving her out of the graces of the many. You listen to me, you little bitch. This also explains why they're suddenly hybrids with grenades that they just toss your way. It would seem that Diego's military personnel that got infected did prove too much for Bronson and her security team. This is what I mean by the game's theme of defiance. Sure, you'll most likely die horribly and just be flicked off like a light switch, but it's that or be assimilated into a parasitic hive mind where they can use you as a tool, where you don't fully die, where you are not yourself, instead you are part of many. There's another character that did stand out to me, but it is much later in the game and we still have to finish operations in the recreation sectors. I backtrack all the way to the crew quarters of medical and I input a code that I found up in operations that opens up the armory. Inside you can find grenades, an assault rifle, whiskey, an EMP rifle, medical supplies, and a stasis field generator, which can immobilize a target. I don't have any points in energy again, so I won't be using it, but it's the only working one so far that I found in the game other than this broken version. There's another code you can find which will open up the operations deck armory. Other than the giant mech, inside lies the best weapon in the game, the fusion cannon can't use it now, but it's really good. I'll go much more in-depth with it later, but we'll leave it near the elevator for now. Sending to recreation, you'll see another human being through the window who mistakes us for Delacroix, which I don't know how you can mistake her for this fucking goober, but he runs away after being shot at by robots. Our objective for this floor is to locate a transmitter to warn Earth and to derive Xerxes of further power. However, the basketball court is locked off, so we must locate these art panels with the codes. The first one is in the lobby, but the others are throughout the station, including outside. And yes, I googled the code because numbers aren't in order, and fuck that, but we'll get to that later. I was save scumming and modifying my weapon to increase its stats when a monkey shot a fireball at me, scaring the hell out of me, little fucker. Down the hall from the monkey, you'll find an audio log from Murdoch. And through the bulkhead door, further down the hall, you can actually find her corpse. Clearly, she didn't get very far- OH SHIT! After I searched the security station, I jumped down because I saw a bunch of snacks and a medkit, and I like snacks. Then I crawl into this vent. The voices of the many echo off veiled threats, since they know their babies need they sleep. 
And brother, my shotgun is the melatonin. It's very clear that we're inside of a rest and relaxation area. Full of, you know, bars, casinos, buffets, concessions. Anything to have a nice time after hours. Even a casino. Wait, I already mentioned casino. Ah, god dang it. The ambience features this ominous droning. It sets an eerie tone and it reminds me of something from Half-Life 2. Within this pool room, I am directed towards a room under the gardens of the ship. The catch being that it's filled with the bodies that were left there during the first stages of the Menis outbreak. Here, we enter the garden. I can't really describe the feeling I get from this track. It's uneasy, puts me on edge, but it creates this tension that just feels so natural. The creepiest thing is that you'll see corpses that were in the middle of being buried. Eggs laying inside of rooms filled with corpses to be used for biomass. The whole idea that this garden must have been a nice place to relax and see some plant life in the dead of space, but turned into a breeding ground, is pretty creepy. I, I like it. The midwives even flank me, and as I'm running, I get into quite a stepsis predicament, as more reinforcements are sent my way to protect their eggs. Yeah, I hate this room. Now this bulkhead leads outside the apartments, but I go back because I want to explore the mall. It's a nice place. I take up to the second floor so I can destroy the mechs from above without causing too much trouble. Then I pick up a log from a man named Rosenberg, who was killed trying to stop someone from stealing from the replicator. We're here for a stash that he has locked away. Oh yeah, these stations act as a perk system. There's only like five throughout the whole game, so pick whatever suits your style. I completely forgot about them until now. Look around until you reach the sensual stimulation units. And before you get excited, no, there isn't some cyborg or android waifu inside, but instead are beds that just offer a simulated experience. We can find one of Rosenberg's audio logs where he explains he left his nanites and cybernetic modules inside of Nikki's room. Of, co of course, the name's Nikki. Just look to see which room is hers and then purchase the keycard for a reward of 10 modules and 503 nanites. Don't bother with the other keycards. All the rooms are empty except for one and the corpse only has like 20 nanites. You don't really need the audio log either, you can just save scum in all honesty. Just remember, some kind of god is watching you. Take a stop at the casino before I begin my venture along the apartments. Go ahead and loot them up for any goodies, but be sure to stop at level 2. There's a door with a code of 11111, which I actually forgot somehow. Inside is the Viral Proliferator, which is kind of an alien grenade launcher. You need exotic weapon points, so I didn't use it, but go ahead and give it a try if you're interested. I did, however, find this room on the second floor, which had an opened vent. Not only does it provide a nice shortcut back to the lobby, but also has a corpse that contains an armored piece of flesh. Well, it's not the best suit in the game, it offers resistance to both damage and all the elements in the game, as well as increasing your psi ability by two. I do research it for later and I use it to finish the game. One thing I love is how the game punishes you if you don't read the research notes pertaining to the flesh armor. The suit is made out of worms and the reason it saps your psi bar is because it prevents the suit from consuming its owner. And yes, it isn't just flavor text. The suit will actually harm you, which can be potentially detrimental if you're not paying attention. Just a little fact that I liked. I also get enough points for the fusion cannon, but I'm not gonna show it off just yet. We'll keep that dopamine hit held off for just a little while. Now, I did go out to search for the code within the paintings, but I gave up and suddenly the code appeared before my eyes. Sending out the transmission and allowing Shodan access to the main elevator, that leads to the command deck. I am spoken to by the many again, and one thing I love about them is how they make it seem like your transgressions, despite how little or major they are, seem so small, like it's nothing but a minor setback for them. Even though you can tell from their voice tone that they are quite pissed. At the end of this tram ride, I pick up a log from Prefontaine. Listening to it gives us insight on a new enemy and how we can defeat it. He is a character we'll hear more of in the final level, so I'll spare you the existential horror for a little bit more. You're welcome. I also get a transmission from Delacroix herself, who asks me to meet her in one of the cargo bays. Spoiler alert, you don't get to do that. Also, again, I put another frowny face in my script, just to clarify. What's interesting here is that we can see a couple running off from one of the bigger monsters. If you follow in suit, you'll see that they took a shuttle and escaped the station. Oh, they were- Ah, oh, you motherfuck. Although we couldn't hitch a ride, it's refreshing to see that they got a good ending, at least. Totally. Fun fact, you can walk into your own proximity mines. It's not just me, but a hundred me. Now, there is a log from Chief Flight Officer Norris. What's unique is that we get an experience from someone who got infected by the many, but actually goes into detail. I'll let it play out. And I had the strangest dream. I was in my room by myself. But all of a sudden, there was not just me there, but a hundred me's. A thousand me's. 
The strange thing was, it felt good. I felt like I was part of something. Wake up along. I hope I have the same dream tonight. Oh shit. Inside what looks to be a conference room. Toxic hazard. Might pick up another log from Diego. Before it was clear that he got infected, but here he seems normal again, seemingly able to resist the parasite. He has a sense of guilt blaming himself over the entire infestation. They got Karechkin, but that bastard is weak. I am not weak. I can resist this cancer. And if I cannot, I will remove it forcibly. His sheer willpower is admirable. I also find another audio log from Karenchkin. Oh my god. He's... he's seen better days. Um, anyway. He mentions how Shodan recruited two people against them, being ourselves and Delacroix. I didn't mention this because I don't know how to make good videos, but you can find recordings from Delacroix who was acting on behalf of Shodan as well as us, thinking doing so would save the ship. The rest is just more positive reinforcements on the many. I lift the security lockdown and make my way to the command deck to secure the ops key. I then sprint all the way back to operations to unlock the one room we couldn't enter before, and I lift yet another lockdown before I am tasked by our abusive mommy, god I can't believe I just said that, to overload the core and destroy the Von Braun. I, I can now destroy this infestation. Spoiler alert, that doesn't happen. I'm redirected from command to the shuttle bay so I can destroy a ship full of eggs. I destroy the first one, but the second one had its control panel destroyed, so I have to hack a replicator to craft a device which will act as a way to disable the shield. I did actually hack this replicator prior to getting the objective to hack it, so I had to actually re-hack it with basically zero in hacking because I wasted an icebreaker on it previously. I had to save scum even after spending my modules just to proceed. If you don't have a high enough hack or lack an icebreaker, I'm not sure how you're meant to proceed, so no my pain. Shodan tells me into my delicate ears that I straight murdered their children. As I'm running back, I'm ambushed by a horde of hybrids, which genuinely scared me because I wasn't expecting them. Okay, see this floating enemy we're warned about? Here's the first solution. See this brain? Here's the second solution. Oh, he's alive? Alright, here's a third. I take the grav lift up and- oh my god, they're the ship now. Okay, I really like the Rickenbacker level. It's hell, don't get me wrong, but you have the most amount of freedom to traverse since it's quite opened. The main objective is hunting down these eggs that will spawn the next generation of the many, so it's in Shodan's and humanity's best interests to see them destroyed. Before I do, however, I get a transmission from none other than Diego himself, alive and, well, not quite so well, I imagine. But he has enough strength to tell us that he's stuck in the sick bay, then orders us to stay alive. The Rickenbacker is huge, but also consists of many enclosed areas. Despite how open the Rickenbacker is for exploration, there is one contradicting word I like to use to describe it. Claustrophobic. The tight hallways and service shafts keep you on edge. Any explosive weapons are a death sentence, and enemies can just be right around the corner. If you had an issue with the spiders, I hope you're ready to have them all within a 5 foot radius at all times. I mean, just look at this clip here. I'm slowly traversing these pipes because I fear that there will be a rocket or a nasty spider ray to jump out at me. In conclusion, the Rickenbacker is a great level. Do I hate it? Yes. Also, the turrets? Fuck the turrets. Specifically the rocket ones. Fuck the rocket ones. If you don't yet believe my hatred for the turrets, just look at this clip here. I didn't take my time and I ran around the corner just to get blasted at point blank range. Yeah, the close quarters aren't an understatement. Go slow inside of the Rickenbacker. Also, it's here where I start using the fusion cannon. And as you can see, it's two-shotting most enemies and the splash damage is very minimal. The weapon is a powerhouse that will carry you throughout the final hour or two of the game. Ammo is surprisingly plentiful on the Rickenbacker, so if you ever think you'll be forced to use it sparingly, brother, no you won't. The amount of catharsis I felt whenever I blasted a spider with this thing is too much to handle and I'm okay with that. It's a therapeutic experience. There are two things I want to go over real fast. One, we get information about how the infection got out of control so quickly. We find yet another audio log, and yes I know, this whole video is just a compiled rendition of that. But it explains how Anatoly ordered hydroponics to be cleared of staff, which would explain why the infestation was at its worst there. Next, I want to cover a character named Crocker. 
I'll sadly find him dead because I didn't want to animate another NPC. This guy single-handedly survived on the Rickenbacker longer than anyone else just to spite the many, doing everything in his power to impede their every move. Cracker, I respect it, man. Rest in peace, dude. Keep up that good work. Make your way room to room, search out these volcanic eggs, and destroy them. There is a path you can follow where the last egg will be, right at the exit, but I missed one, so I had to go all the way back until I found the last egg and then ran back to pod 2. The many speak out at me, and they're so fed up with me that they won't even try to assimilate me, instead opting to just cut me down and use my body as raw biomass. I think they're getting a little mad. Once we go through pod 2, we get a message from Shodan who confirms that she had a robotic servant render us unconscious as she rigged us up with implants. I mean, hell, this revelation is brought to us right as we near a church. Of course, that means that the Polito the other characters were talking to wasn't her at all. Surprise, surprise. In medical, after clearing out these damn spiders, we see a corpse on the, well, ceiling, and yes, it belongs to Captain Diego. I grab his card and I pick up his final audio log. I'll just let this play out because you're gonna listen to Steven Russell and you're going to like it. Those worms were a cancer in my body, so I had the auto dog cut it out. Hey, you think they're gonna let you blow up the Von Braun? The many will never allow it. I've got something to help you. It's in my quarters. You'll find the access card on my body. Take the fight to them, soldier. And remember, you're the only one trust. We'll have to stop by his office and see what he's left us. Okay, I don't know what happened here, but I ran into a room full of bulky monsters and turrets and I resorted to climbing onto these consoles to escape their wrath. Also, I found out this nice fun fact about the fusion cannon, you can set it to death. The splash damage increases, we will be close to one-shotting every enemy in the game, and its splash damage is still pretty minimal, so go ahead and rock that thing. I go inside Diego's quarters for his gift of nothing. Did I just get set up? Oh, that motherfu- I launch the escape pod before the screen suddenly goes to black from the crash. Well, this sucks. Ooh, wrench. If saving your game wasn't already a dead giveaway, we're inside the body of the many, where the core of their brain lies. This area captures the feeling of being inside of a body quite well because you'll see nerves, veins, vast quantities of biomass, water that I don't think is water, gross, and even these tubes that feature movement of what I imagine is more biomass. Parts of the ship are even consumed inside of it. We didn't just crash into their body, we didn't leave the ship at all. The Rickenbacker is just consumed as part of their biology now. Feel to be one against the infinite. Remember him? We found his audio log earlier before he was taken here. Prefontaine doesn't remember how we ended up inside, but he explores and experiences closest than anyone has ever been able to so far. You'll find his audio logs everywhere and his purpose is to give you information on how they operate from a first-hand perspective. We learn that the flies are male, the worms female. We learn that the spiders, giant brutes, and all that we've seen so far are made for different purposes, each taking more biomass than the other. The entire point of the spiders is to just consume and conserve as much energy as possible. The brutes are meant solely for protection. If it wasn't for our grenade launcher and fusion cannon, maybe our cybernetic implants too, they would have slaughtered us way back. Listening in on Prefontaine's final moments is actually pretty depressing. His final one, he's full of fear before he's just chomped and consumed. I seem to have stepped into something soft and slippery. Anyway, there's these sections with giant teeth. I hate the giant teeth, specifically this part, where I spent 10 minutes trying to platform to the other side just so I could progress. My own speed was a detriment because I had max agility and I just didn't take my time here for some reason. Maybe because I'm just so autistic. Eventually, we make our way to the hive mind itself. I sprint inside and I first take out these mini brains so I can dispatch the floating monsters. The guards prove nothing more than an annoyance, so I take care of them, shoot these flying stars, and I fire my fusion cannon into the heart of the many. With that, the many are no more, aside from just leftover biomass. Of course, Shodan betrays us because we're governed by our free will. Remember the engine core we overloaded? Yeah, that gave her control of the ship. She wants to use the Von Braun's faster than light travel to create her own pockets of reality, turning everything into cyberspace eventually. Somehow. I have no idea how this works, but we'll stick with it. 
We find a floating audio log of Delacroix, who is unfortunately dead, but she uses these to guide us throughout this virtual pocket of Shodan's memories. In this area, I learned that the level design is straight from System Shock 1, at least the remake. I recognize this section in the middle, and then down here is where you'd normally get your first pistol. Nice little touch. The cameras don't detect us since they're just memories. Floating balls of geometry, however, will hurt you along with the cyborg assassins. Continue on and you'll drop down. Don't go all the way down though, worst mistake of my life. Shodan drops more of your inferior rhetoric before we're dropped into another boss fight. There's this human form of Shodan that will go after you, but just shoot her with the fusion cannon and she drops. I hack into these terminals to disable her shields, destroy each one until I get an opening to fire death mode into her stupid face. Here we get the final cutscene. Offering to ascend us past our corporeal flesh before this absolute googly-eyed motherfucking goober of a protagonist drops his one and only voice line in the game to give us the silliest send-off to a game I have ever witnessed. Join me, human, and we can rule, and we can rule together. Nah. Or if you even mention her soy jacket, yeah, I swear to f Our protagonist sends out an alert for when a military vessel happens by. Now, Tommy, the man who escaped earlier with his girlfriend, receives the hail and for some reason he thinks it's a good idea to investigate. Like, how does he know it's not the many? They have been proven to be quite deceitful so far. Who knows? On the bright side, at least they had a happy end. Oh shit. Oh yeah, sequel baited. Now of course, this ending is obviously here because they were gonna do a System Shock 3, but it's a game that will never come out. We get these dumb but really passionate ending slides of the developers, which I just love. Where is he? There he is. Now, one final thing I want to make a note of before ending this video. The soldier may have defeated the many, shut down Xerxes, and interned the security, but he's still alone on this ship. I don't doubt he has plenty of food and drink as well as cleaner sleeping quarters to survive for years in, maybe. But he's still inside by himself, inside of a ship full of decaying corpses and mass. The isolation would be debilitating on his psyche. There's no guarantee that anyone would show up in a speedy manner. I don't know, I just came to that realization during the recording. Let me know what you guys think. With that, we beat System Shock 2. Overall, yeah, this game's pretty good. Not only is it one of the best M Sims and one of the earliest ones, but it's a great horror game. Where its presentation, atmosphere, and audio design carries the horror rather than these silly little jump scares. So I'll play through. Hope you all enjoyed. This was a bit of a more serious video, so let me know how I did. I'll probably be doing more videos like my Felvedick and Twilight Town one, because that's probably where most of you came from, so expect more on that. Though feel free to comment any criticisms down below. Hope you decided to drop a like and subscribe since this video took the soul out of me. Anyway, thanks for watching and peace out. Hope you all have a good day.